Welcome to Time for Teens. Today we're pleased to have with us anchorman and sports reporter Vi Sikahema, who is currently on NBC 10 News in Philadelphia. He had an accomplished career in football. He played in the NFL and also played at Brigham Young University, where he obtained a degree in communications. Today he talks to us about strength in personal testimony. It is good to be with all of you this afternoon. My family and I live back east in uh, New Jersey to be exact, uh, specifically southern New Jersey. We're just across the Delaware River from the uh, city of brotherly love. I work as a broadcaster uh, in local news at the NBC station, which Tanya has uh, had just mentioned. Uh, before that, I had a football career that took us from places like uh, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, or as they say there, Missouri. Uh, we went to Phoenix, Arizona, and then Green Bay, Wisconsin, and uh, my football career ended uh, in Philadelphia, where I then transitioned into work in television. And to that end, I have prepared a uh, media presentation for you today that I hope will both uh, uh, enlighten you and uh, also uh, entertain you, and, and hopefully, the most importantly, will edify you uh, this afternoon. Uh, what I came prepared to talk to you about today was uh, the strength of a personal testimony. Uh, what is it? How do I get it? How long does it take to get? Uh, if I get it, uh, if I get a testimony, what will it do for me? How will it bless or enrich my life? Um, there's a di the dictionary defines a testimony as a declaration by a witness under oath as that given before a court or deliberative body. I suspect that most of you recognize that lawyers use testimony as a form of evidence. Those of us who work in the media use testimony as a way to, uh, to bring uh, some light onto a subject or to clarify and give some understanding to a subject or to an event. That's how we use testimony uh, in the media and, in, and as journalists. But what we're after today is something much more personal. It is how to gain a personal testimony or witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is what Elder M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve said about a testimony. He said, a testimony is a witness or a confirmation of eternal truth impressed upon individual hearts and souls through the Holy Ghost, whose primary ministry is to testify of truth, particularly as it relates to the Father and the Son. When one receives a testimony of truth through this divinely appointed process, the process of gaining a testimony is a divinely appointed one it will immediately begin to have an impact on that person's life. And this is what President Joseph Fielding Smith said about the subject. A testimony of the gospel is a convincing knowledge given by revelation to the individual who humbly seeks the truth. For me, that begs the question, um, will a testimony and the, this convincing knowledge given by revelation be made available to anybody? This is what Elder Lawrence C. Dunn of the Quorum of the Seventy said about that. He said, not only is it the right of every member to know for himself, but every soul, whether member or non-member, can, if he desires, receive a realization that God the Father actually lives, that Jesus Christ is his Son, that Joseph Smith was a true prophet, that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is that kingdom of God on earth and that the Book of Mormon is true. That means basically that some of your friends may have uh, testimonies of the gospel. And I'm talking about your non-member friends. Uh, you may wonder, is it possible for a non-member friend to have a testimony of the gospel? Not only is it possible, but it's likely that many of your friends may have a testimony of some aspect of the gospel that may surpass yours. Here's a good example. I'm going to show you a story that was filed by a colleague of mine back east about a young man who forfeited a state championship because of his testimony of the Sabbath day. Yeah. We're going for a state title here, and to not be able to do that is a huge disappointment. Dan Halley's winning streak may be derailed by God himself. Dan and his doubles partner, Ryan Wendell, are the top boys tennis duo in South Jersey, and many expected them to be contenders in the New Jersey State Championship. That is, until they saw their match was Sunday, June 3rd. 
damned strict Presbyterian faith observes all Ten Commandments, including no work or play on Sundays, no exceptions. You, know, you can't make exceptions for God because you can't make exceptions for anything like that. Because if if not, you can't. If you do it once, then why not again? Dan's father petitioned the Cumberland Regional School District to reschedule Sunday competition, but was told the league has to play on Sunday in order to fit in all the matches. This is just another example of, of how the system is messed up and how it needs to be changed so that we can really encourage our kids to um, you know, follow our values, follow, follow the, the Bible. Dan's coach and athletic director applaud his convictions. It's something you've got to feel real good about for the young man. So while you're upset that maybe the team isn't playing, you can understand the young man's conviction. And so you get very torn. But New Jersey's State Interscholastic Athletic Association says Dan Halley's parents were told last year there might be Sunday matches that can't be rescheduled. And Dan may have to withdraw from the championship where Cumberland Regional High School could be sanctioned. The parents didn't have to wait this long. Uh, they knew what the rules were before the time. Now, if you're going to wait to the last minute and appeal, you're, and you don't get your appeal, or you're out of time. With just a week to go before the New Jersey Boys Tennis Championships, it does not appear as though either Dan Halley or the league are going to give in. In South Jersey, Doug Scheimel, NBC 10 News. So, how does one uh, gain a testimony? Well, the Book of Mormon defines that for us. I'm going to refer you to the cover page of the Book of Mormon, second paragraph down. Uh, take a look at this. It says, And also to the convincing of the Jew and the Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself unto all nations. So the purpose of the Book of Mormon is to convince the world, Jew and Gentile, that Jesus is the Christ. This is what the uh, prophet Moroni said concerning gaining a testimony using the Book of Mormon. He said, Behold, I would exhort you that when ye shall read these things, if it be wisdom in God that ye should read them, that ye would remember how merciful the Lord hath been unto the children of men, from the creation of Adam, even down until the time that ye shall receive these things, and ponder it in your hearts. And when ye shall receive these things, I would exhort you that ye would ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. And if he, shall re if he shall ask with a sincere heart and with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, ye will know, ye may know the truth of all things. So there's a three-step process. If you read this carefully, you need to read, and you must ponder, and you must pray. That's how one goes about gaining a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, um, how long does this take? Well, that depends. It depends on your individual worthiness. It depends on your circumstances. And it depends uh, also on your sincerity. Uh, but we do have some clues as to how long the process may take. Uh, Brigham Young, uh, I understand it took him two years to investigate the church and to finally come to an understanding that this was the truth. On the other hand, John Taylor, it is said that it took him two weeks to come to the same conclusion. Wilford Woodruff uh, had a lengthier process. It took him six years to come to the realization that the Church of Jesus Christ had been restored to the earth. On the other hand, Lorenzo Snow, upon meeting the prophet Joseph Smith in 1831, said this, A light arose in my understanding which has never been extinguished. Apparently, for Lorenzo Snow, the moment was instantaneous. He knew the moment he met the prophet. So, it just depends. Doctrine and Covenants 46 uh, says that we all are given different gifts. And for some, it is given the gift to believe. And I suspect Lorenzo Snow was one of those people who just had a believing heart. Uh, I think all of those men did. It just took some a little bit longer. Uh, it also says that for some, it is given to believe in the words of those who do believe. If any of you grew up in the church and your parents have always believed that this is the truth, I suspect you probably grew up having that faith. But at some point, it will be incumbent upon each of you to have that testimony, that personal testimony, uh, for yourself. So, that's the process. Uh, once I gain a testimony, what, what will it do for me? How will it bless and enrich my life? Well, if you have a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, I promise you that it will bless you 
in ways that may not even be apparent to you. Uh, those of you who uh, have a For Strength of Youth pamphlet at home, raise your hand. You have the For Strength of Youth pamphlet. Good. Hope you read it every day. Thumb through it. Uh, let me refer you to page 36. This is what it says. Any form of alcohol is harmful to your body and spirit. Being under the influence of alcohol weakens your judgment and self-control and could lead you to break the law of chastity or other commandments. Drinking can lead to alcoholism, which destroys individuals and families. I hope that you recognize how um, following the word of wisdom and the guidelines from page 36 of uh, for the strength of youth is protecting you in ways that may not even be apparent to you. Um, let me turn you and refer you to page 12 of the uh, For the Strength of Youth pamphlet. This is what it says. It says, Choose your friends carefully. They will greatly influence how you think and act and even help determine the person you will become. Choose friends who will share your values so you can strengthen and encourage each other in living high standards. A true friend will encourage you to be your best self. Now, I submit to you that choosing wisely your friends uh, will have a great impact and will have a great deal to do with how you will be protected physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Can you, can, you, can you recognize that? Can you all see that? How that does that? How the church helps us in that way? I hope you do. Uh, one of the things that I uh, preach ad nauseum to my children and always have since they were toddlers is to choose their friends carefully, and I hope that all of you do that. Um, how many of you here are of dating age? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you uh, uh, who are dating have been to a prom? Have done the prom, okay? Uh, not all of you have, but some of you have done the prom. Uh, we learned something back east uh, uh, in, in working with the youth uh, that came about of discussions with uh, our youth council, um, and that is something that unbeknownst to local leaders of the church in our area, uh, reports from some of the kids came back telling us that their school proms were nothing more than young adult nightclubs in the uh, inappropriate music that's played and the way that, uh, uh, that people dress, um, alcohol was often consumed, um, all kinds of things were happening at their school proms that they weren't very comfortable with. So. Uh, some of them suggested through our youth, counts, uh, youth conference committee that we ought to put together our own youth, uh, our own uh, prom, and we would have a stake prom. So wouldn't you know it, uh, they gathered, the kids gathered as a committee, as a council, and they decided to make plans and prepare uh, to have our own stake youth prom uh, for just the kids in the state. They sent out uh, flyers and they sent out the invitations that looked like that. It's hard for you to read, but it's uh, a night of Paris, which we turned our cultural center, our basketball court, into uh, something that uh, looked like Paris, I think. We've been to Paris, but it didn't really look like Paris. Uh, but it was beautiful nonetheless. Uh, and this is what the kids came up with. They decided that uh, there would be uh, no tuxedos, unless you already owned one, and uh, so that there wouldn't be any uh, financial burden on the kids. Uh, they encourage the young men to wear suits. Most of the kids have suits, and if they didn't have suits, at the very least, wear a shirt and tie. For the young women, uh, they wanted them to wear formal dresses, of course, but of course, the dresses had to be modest and conform to the For the Strength of Youth pamphlet. Uh, let me show you a picture from uh, our stake prom. Now, you tell me if that just isn't uh, a great shot. Uh, one, two, three, four, four couples, four priests, and their dates were all laurels, and they just look magnificent. Um, and I have to tell you, I'm quite proud of the way they looked. And they were awaiting dinner. The adult leaders made uh, spaghetti dinner, which they always make at any youth program that they have. It's the old standby. And uh, how about this group photo? Now, it wasn't a great big um, dance, but... Enough of the kids came, and they had dates, and I must uh, tell you that it was a wonderful time for everybody there, and they just looked terrific. In fact, it was such a unique uh, occurrence where we live 
that a, the local newspaper sent a photographer and they ran this photo on the front page of the metro section. And this is what it says, and I'll read for you the caption. Prom night there away, Jessica Tromlin of Maple Shade and her date Adam Rivera of Pennsville danced the night away at a prom at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Cherry Hill. Basically, it would be free from alcohol, uh, premarital sex, and all the kinds of things that happens in their school proms. So... Uh, it was a great time, and the local media picked up on the fact that it was such a unique occurrence that young people would gather and have a prom that they decided to send out a photographer, and it ran in the front page of the metro section, which gives the church uh, a lot of good publicity. Having a testimony will endow all of you with the power of discernment, which is so important in the days in which we live. Elder David A. Bednar, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, recently came to BYU and he spoke to the students and he told a story that was rather interesting. He told a story of a young man who returned from a mission and dated, found and dated a girl that he hoped to court and marry. But in the last minute, he changed his mind for one simple reason. He realized that she was wearing two earrings on one ear. Nothing, no big deal. But he recognized and he realized that the prophet Gordon B. Hinckley had asked women and young women to do what? Wear one earring per ear. And he recognized through the power of discernment that he's endowed with because he has a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ that this may be a portent of things to come for him in a marriage down the road. Take a listen to Elder Bednar. But she did not take them out. This was a valuable piece of information for this young man, and he felt unsettled about her non-responsiveness to a prophet's pleading. For this and other reasons, he ultimately stopped dating the young woman because he was looking for an eternal companion who had the courage to promptly and quietly obey the counsel of the prophet in all things and at all times. The young man was quick to observe that the young woman was not quick to observe. To be quick to observe. I love that. Elder Bednar concluded his remarks by saying and reminding the students here at BYU that this story was not about the earrings. He was teaching a principle, but he reminded students it wasn't about the earrings. It's about having uh, the discernment to pay attention to the little things and because if we pay attention to the little things, it will help us in our lives. Now, Section 89 of the Doctrine and Covenants was given to the Prophet Joseph Smith in part because, as he, as, as he said, that, uh, that there exists evils and designs among conspiring men in the last days. Because there would be evils and designs uh, in the last days among conspiring men. Now... The prophet David O. McKay suggested that these conspiring men were the tobacco executives and their evil designs were their clever ad advertising campaigns that would entice us to use their products. Do you think that's still relevant today? He said this in 1949. Now let me refer you to this uh, series of ads that came out, oh, 15, maybe 18 years ago. Do you recognize these ads? The, uh, they were called, uh, this ad campaign, I believe, was called Joe Cool or Joe Camel. And uh, what was especially interesting about it, and they were roundly criticized for the fact that they were advertising to a target market. Who do you think they were trying to target this campaign towards? Youth. Teens. Um, you saw there the you know, muscle shirt and the muscle car. Well, a number of years ago, the uh, Congress of the United States passed a law that would prohibit advertise, uh, advertising for tobacco companies on television. So they've stopped doing it, which is a good thing. But it hasn't stopped others from reaching out and trying to reach you through the media. Uh, Money Magazine cited this year that in the Super Bowl that just finished a few months ago, that advertisers were paying close to two and a half million dollars for a half minute ad. 30 seconds advertisers were paying two and a half million dollars 
so that they can reach you. Fox Television, according to them, they said that all 59 slots had been sold to various companies. And this telling quote from Jack Myers, an independent media analyst, he said the Super Bowl is a way to reach hard to get audiences. Now, uh, if you watch the Super Bowl, and I admit that I do, it's part of my work, I watch the Super Bowl, uh, what do they advertise in the Super Bowl? Beer, alcohol, and how do they advertise that product on television? Do they use uh, uh, old ladies and old men? No, they use what look like to me supermodels, and they're scantily clad. And it's for one simple purpose. It's to reach out and extend their influence to reach all of you. That's the reason why uh, they do that. I submit to you that if you have a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it will protect you in ways that may not even be apparent to you even now. And part of the ways is to be able to decipher uh, the mixed messages and the signals that come to you via the media, and it happens on a daily basis. These uh, people are conspiring men, and, the, and their designs are evil. They're trying to reach out to you, and they'll do it in the most subtle ways. They'll do it in 30-second increments, and they'll plant thoughts and ideas in your minds, and they'll do it in 30-second ads, and they'll do it in such a way, and they're paying such uh, an enormous amount of money to do it because they want to influence you. They want to influence you. And think about that. And think about what the prophets have said concerning that subject. Now, in the interest of fairness, uh, some of us in the media do sincerely try to use the media for the noble purpose that I believe it was intended. And uh, let me show you something that we did back in Philadelphia. Well, Eagle fans all know that the Birds are a close-knit team. But within the ranks is an even closer group bonded by a common faith. NBC 10's Vice Ekehema shares in that bond. He and John Clark have the story from Jacksonville. John, as you know, and probably a lot of our viewers know, I share a couple of things in common with head coach Andy Reid, also Chad Lewis, the tight end, and Reno Mahe, the backup running back, in that we all graduated from BYU, and we're also members of the same faith. We're Mormons, and so when the Eagles won last week to earn a trip to the Super Bowl, the wheels were already in motion by the BYU Alumni Association to put together a little program where we would come down here and address members of our faith and BYU alumni. Nearly 2,000 people fill this chapel in Jacksonville to hear from players they've followed since their BYU college days. Well, he's a running back. I forgot his name, but he's bad, man. <laughs> they got an added bonus in that BYU alum Steve Young is also here for the game. I just came to watch these guys speak. <laughs> But clearly, the star of this event was Chad Lewis. I couldn't believe it when, when I looked in and saw that room was packed. Um, and so late, you know, people are still here. Um, it was a lot of fun. You've, you've done this kind of thing. You talk in front of people. Uh, have you ever talked in front of such a large crowd? Never. <laughs> I, I, wasn't very, I wasn't used to this. Um, but it was very exciting to be a part of it. I'm Vaisukahema for NBC10. Now. I hope that all of you, uh, those of you, especially you young men, uh, will become captains of industry and will extend your influence and extend the influence of the church. I hope that you'll become uh, news broadcasters so that you can help extend the influence of the gospel. And we need good, we need good people in advertising that can help extend uh, good things and positive influences to the world. We need that of you. We expect it of you. I think the Lord expects that of us. Um, we try to do our best back east. Um, and I'm grateful that I had the blessings and the blessing of uh, the people that I work for who encourage me when it's uh, relevant to our listening audience, to our viewership, to uh, share with them what we do in the church. They think it's, it's important because they know it's important to me. I'm going to show you one other clip before we close today. Uh, and this just happened just a couple of days ago. As you, as you watch this clip, I want you to pay attention, not so much to me, but what's going on in the background and see if you can pick up and listen to what they're doing in the background. Okay, let's let it roll. 
Well, as I'm sure many of you know, Terrell Owens not with the Eagles right now, but a saga has followed the team to Pittsburgh, plus the Phillies. Blows in on a lead for a wild card berth. We have both games covered across the state. NBC10's John Clark live in Pittsburgh. Sports director Vi Sikahema live at Citizens Bank Park. Let's begin with Vi. Hey, Vince, this may look like a business person special. Actually, uh, these are the missionaries from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Philadelphia Mission, it is uh, Mormon night, which is part of the reason why I'm here tonight. They're singing the national anthem tonight. But let's talk about the Eagles and the situation they've got on their hands. They've just turned up the heat a little bit on Terrell Owens. Today, they sent a formal letter uh, to uh, Owens at his home in Atlanta basically uh, telling him that when he comes back to camp on Wednesday, they're going to expect him to be at his best behavior and, in fact, have a change of attitude. This is basically what I reported on Friday when I said that I had uh, met with and spoken to a member of the team's brass who told me the same thing, and now they've uh, just followed up uh, uh, in person and in kind. More on this, let's go to uh, John Clark, who's standing by in Pittsburgh with the team. Hey, John. Hey, we thought we'd be able to get away from it for one night, Vi. Reno Mahe will start, and Vi, I'm sure you're going to be watching him closely. He's your cousin or nephew or <laughs> He's friend? something. If he plays well, something. he's going to be my son tonight, John. Thank you very much. Also out there in Pittsburgh, the Penguins today signed John LeClaire to a two-year deal. Speaking of the Flyers, his former team, they introduced today Peter Forsberg, their newest star center. Got a two-year contract, and so let the Stanley Cup dreams start. How about the PGA today up in North Jersey? Phil Mickelson wrapping up his round with a four-under. Check out this chip here on 18, and he would birdie 18 to win by two strokes at your sports. I'm Vice Ikehama for NBC10, and thank you very much, uh, missionaries from the uh, Philadelphia Mission. We'll have much more later on tonight at 11 o'clock. Back to you guys in studio. I just thought it was funny that through the highlights and Phil Mickelson chipping in on the 18th, then in the background, the missionaries are singing, onward. <laughs> I just love that. And it may have been a television first uh, to have missionaries singing in the background while somebody was doing highlights uh, on TV. Well, obviously, uh, the media can be used for noble purposes, and we try to do our best. Now, as I close today, um, let me ask you this. Has anybody ever heard of the name George Miller? Anybody ever heard of George Miller? Nobody's ever heard of George Miller. Well, I didn't expect you to. George Miller was a rather obscure figure in church history. Um, he didn't do anything uh, big, and he... You've heard of George Miller? Okay. No, no, he's not the golfer. <laughs> That's Johnny Miller. <laughs> nice try. George Miller... Uh, now, I'm, I'm using him as an example because um, while I said uh, that we encourage you to get a great education and do the best you can so you can be captains of industry and, um, you know, do whatever you can do to help extend the influence of the church when you have a gospel of the testimony, it's also important that you know that the most important influence that you can have is, as the prophet once said, within the walls of your own home, right? George Miller was one of these people. George Miller lived in the 1800s, in the 1830s and 40s, and by all accounts, he was a good man. But I think he was more than a good man. He, uh, he was, I believe, uh, the first bishop in the church called to preside over a ward in the church, and it happened during the Nauvoo period. The Nauvoo period of the church, I suspect that the prophet Joseph Smith may have kept a ledger detailing who was on his side and who wasn't, who was with him and who was against him. He had people abandoning him left and right. His closest friends were leaving him and became bitter enemies of the church and of the prophet. And all, through all of this, George Miller remained a constant friend to the prophet. And for this, <clears throat> George Miller is mentioned only once, I believe, in Scripture. And it's one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. <clears throat> it's found in the 124th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. And this is what the Lord said of George Miller. And again, verily I say unto you, my servant George Miller is without guile. He may be trusted because of the integrity of his heart and for the love which he has to my testimony. I, the Lord, love him. 
<clears throat> I pray that we may live our lives, that we can hear the Lord say of us someday that we are without guile and that we can be trusted and that for our testimonies, I, the Lord, love you. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.